So I, I am giving you lots of examples of how it's important and what you can do if you can just get the relative geometry of reflectors. Okay, and if you can get that right. So maybe, you know, right now we're not even so concerned about, about drilling because I'm not saying yet that we can get depths correct. I'm not saying yet that we can get the absolute location of anything correct. Just say the relative dip of two intersecting structures. So here is, uh, uh, I want to talk a little bit about my work in um, central Nevada, which um, is in Dixie Valley. And many of you know that to be a geothermal resource. And I'll show you later how the area that I'm working in um, is uh, in what I would call southern Dixie Valley, or maybe some others would call central Dixie Valley. And it turns out it's a long way from northern Dixie Valley, which is where the geothermal field is. Okay, but we'll talk about why there's no geothermal field in southern Dixie Valley. Um, in, um, what was it, December 4th, um, 1954, um, more, than, uh, more than 50 years ago, um, there was a magnitude um, a magnitude 7.2 earthquake in, uh, um, in Fairview Valley on the east side of Fairview Peak, um, mostly oblique, a uh, large component of strike slip. Uh, this little rupture down here that's hidden by the, uh, the uh, here it is, this little rupture down here is probably uh, the northernmost extent of that. Uh, it could have ruptured, it's hard to tell now, but that Fairview Peak earthquake could have also ruptured over here. And then uh, while all that mess is going on with all of his aftershocks, you know, there were magnitude six aftershocks of, of magnitude seven quakes, of course, uh, four minutes and 20 seconds after the initiation of the Fairview Peak earthquake, the magnitude 7.0, but nobody really knows um, Dixie Valley earthquake initiated. And this is um, um, John Kasky's map of the uh, rupture. He's uh, a uh, Wisnowski student from uh, the 90s. He's now teaching over at uh, um, uh, San Francisco State. And um, you know he really mapped out the rupture uh, which is the thicker lines. You, you may be able to tell, you may not. The thinner lines are scarps that did not rupture in 1954. Of course, Kasky did all of this in the mid-90s, um, but we've discovered that a lot of those ruptures, uh, when I took you guys out there, a lot of those ruptures are still there and all the same features you know, are there almost, uh, almost 60 years later. Ah, OK. So he told you the real story. I'll have to, I'll have to find out from you uh, how much I said uh, that day that was wrong. Um, so good. Um, so um, in Kasky's mapping, he, he decided, uh, after doing all these three-point problems and other things that you heard about on, the, on the, your uh, field trip, um, he decided that the Dixie Valley rupture, unlike the... Um, unlike the uh, Fairview Peak, and unlike really all the, the other th three earthquakes that happened in 1954 in a period of six months, um, it had to be almost purely a normal fault, and it had to be low angle. Okay? Most of the evidence for that and, and the largest rupture was on this north-south striking segment. Okay. Um, uh, there are these ruptures uh, that are even almost east-west striking, and then uh, this northeast striking segment. Um, and if you go further north in Dixie Valley, um, the um, uh, most of the uh, fault ruptures uh, are, are northeast striking. Um, but this north-south striking segment is pretty unique, and uh, it also seems to be uniquely a Low angle, um, normal fault rupture, uh, and by low we mean uh, 30 degrees, okay, 30 degrees dip. Um, 
and uh, uh, it's historic, obviously. Okay, this is a historic rupture. We know it was an earthquake. We don't know for sure that the rupture happened. We don't know how fast the rupture happened. You know, it was a it was a day before anybody got out there. So it's still a permissible mechanism that um, uh, you know maybe it took six hours for the scarp to develop. That's possible. We don't have the observations to uh, confirm that. So maybe it was a weird, slow earthquake. But whatever it was, it's the only example of a, an exposed, mapped, historic, low-angle normal fault that, that we have. We've got lots of low-angle normal fault mechanisms from, say, the center of Papua New Guinea, from Jeff Aber's work. Um, uh, there are uh, places in the Altiplano that appear to have very fresh, um, low-angle normal ruptures, uh, very much like Dixie Valley in South America. Um, but none of those are an observed historic earthquake. All right, so this is unique. So um, I got a little bit of money from uh, the National Science Foundation back in the late 90s to um, examine this rupture seismically and see if I can, you know, is, is it low angle just at the surface? Okay, and then, then does it steepen? Uh, is it, uh, you know, and, and I looked uh, here where there's really just one, one fault. Um, you know, are we seeing a steep normal fault that for some reason is like a low angle landslide in this, in this area? Um, and uh, the places that I took, you know, this, this shadow here is actually on uh, Big Box Canyon. There's Little Box Canyon. Okay. Um, so those are, uh, um, those are places where there's definitely one, one fault. I was at, uh, okay, if we go down to um, this, uh, this map here, um, my profile was at Willow Canyon. This shows you the gravity coverage that we acquired. Uh, going all gravity magnetic, going all the way across the valley into the foothills of the Clan Alpines, um, and our seismic uh, our seismic survey was from the scarp to a, a few miles east. Okay, so not uh, all of Cattle Road, but we definitely crossed Highway uh, 121, um, and the uh, location that we were at is is called Willow Canyon. And then here you can see it's not too far from uh, Little Box Canyon and Big Box Canyon. Um, so one one experiment, yikes, uh, we did was um, uh, really right at the scarp, okay, within 100 meters of the scarp. And um, uh, let me show you the the seismic section that that results from that. Okay, so uh, uh, here we have a, uh, a high resolution uh, reflection result. Uh, I'm presenting it with, as far as I can tell, no vertical exaggeration. Um, the, um, the topographic profile is shown here, and actually there's a road across the scarp right where we took it, so um, you can't see the scarp in the topographic profile because that's actually a little tiny road cut. About one meter deep, um, and then there's uh, uh, there's a back facing uh, scarp that also ruptured in uh, 1954 and a grobbin in between. Um, does uh, Wisniewski still think that one of the weird and, and wonderful things about the 1954 the Dixie Valley rupture is this very wide grobbin about 100 what is it? It's not 100 meters wide. It's like uh, 15 meters wide. Uh, it's not a it's not a two or three meter wide robin like you see on a lot of normal faults. It's it's unusually wide. So Kasky's explanation for that is uh, is that the uh, fault is slightly lystric, goes from uh, as you can see on the scarp fifty degrees um, um, the actual uh, uh, head scarp is fifty degrees uh, dip uh, right at the surface. And then at uh, you know 20, 30, 50 meters depth, uh, it it turns to uh, 30 degrees dip. 
And then lo and behold, you know, here in the seismic data, we see this whopping big reflection, um, impossible to ignore. Uh, and it's it's not, you know, it doesn't appear to be faulted. Uh, it's only 100 meters that it goes that we're tracking it here. Um, you know, it doesn't look like it's uh, um, it's it doesn't look like it's turning to become. Uh, um, uh, any steeper with uh, with depth, okay? So that's uh, you know that's part of it. All right. Now we also uh, laid down a seismic array that extended um, um, for uh, uh, a uh, um, uh, and this is uh, this is actually kind of a north looking view, okay? So uh, this array extended for um, uh, about uh, what is it? Uh, 0.8 kilometer. All right. So the you know we're we're uh, we've got 48 channels here. Not all of them are producing data. Um, and the 1954 rupture is right there. And then you know the next one is is really on the other side of the grave. Okay. And then way down the the slope, uh, you know, really uh, uh, well, you can see the source receiver offset two kilometers away. We set off uh, charges. Actually, uh, uh, six charges went off simultaneously in in six um, um, in six um, uh, shallow holes. Okay, so uh, uh, that that gave a much better result than putting one big charge in in one deeper hole. It was a lot cheaper, and there was a lot less. You didn't get that. Uh, you know, I got six times the charge um, instead of uh, uh, instead of having the the cube root of the uh, charge mass effect, uh, which is a, a really uh, terrible uh, uh, diminishing returns. So uh, you know, we see this planar head wave, and in fact, um, you know, maybe. Uh, uh, maybe it's even it's even it's it's not only arriving simultaneously at further distances it's actually arriving earlier than the um, it's actually arriving earlier than than it is at uh, shorter distances you know at the rupture it's arriving I don't know uh, fifty not fifty uh, uh, ten uh, milliseconds earlier than it is uh, at uh, you know, 1.75 kilometers from the source. Okay, um, and then here's a little bit of the uh, of the uh, uh, direct the direct wave. Uh, now it turns out that um, what's happening here, and uh, I'm going to zoom out a little bit, is that. Um, we have a uh, here's the here's a cross section. Now we're looking north. Okay, so sorry about the reversal there. Um, yeah, this is one of the ones I inserted last night. So we have uh, two different blasts that produce uh, very similar data, and so for this one, for instance, um, you have a wave that goes down, and uh, you know it does reflect from the uh, thirty degree dipping fault plane. Um, and it's also that fault plane is also a substantial um, velocity. It's also a substantial velocity um, interface. So below the fault plane, it's four kilometers per second, and above the fault plane, it's half that velocity. It's only two kilometers per second. Okay. So uh, uh, the angle of the head wave. Okay. Is uh, is going to be the inverse uh, sine of two over four, right? And um, that's going to be the uh, um, that's the critical angle, right? And the inverse sine of one half is thirty degrees. And uh, so then, if you uh, if you tilt that, uh, that's thirty degrees from the refractor. But if the refractor is dipping at thirty degrees. Then the head wave is flat, and there it is. So the head wave is coming up; it's propagating, you know, up along the uh, the fault plane, and it's it's pretty much coming straight up itself. And so the head wave hits the uh, 
of the receivers all at the same time. And, um, and so you get this simultaneous head wave. And here I calculated you know, what would be if, if we had a 39 degree dip. Okay, this would be the angle of the head wave. If we had a 21 degree dip, you know, this would be this dashed line up here would be the angle of the head wave. So it's somewhere between 21 and 39 degrees. Okay, uh, maybe there are some small rumples, but there aren't big diffractions, right? There isn't a, a step and a diffraction, and, a, and the head wave isn't a lot later, right? If this um, if this Piedmont fault was really there. And and there was a big offset along it, and this you know questioned area. If that was alluvium, it was maybe only uh, three kilometers per second, not four kilometers per second. Then we would not expect this head wave to be so coherent. Okay, just like the reflection would not be coherent either. Um, but the head wave uh, uh, is very coherent. You know, up up between these triangles where we're looking at it, and it would not be that coherent if that. Uh, uh, if that Piedmont fault was was really the fault, okay. What what's important here? Which which fault is the uh, is the basin bounding fault, okay? And this little head wave recording really shows that the uh, the Dixie Valley fault at only thirty degrees dip that's the basin bounding fault because the stuff in the questioned area here has got to be fast, so it's got to be the granitoid. Uh, uh, metamorphics of the uh, of the Stillwater range there. All right, now now I, I put this in here sort of for tutorial purposes because you know maybe um, maybe you've got to got to catch up a little uh, in terms of, of seismic processing. Okay, so in um, um, in in uh, my Applied geophysics course, you will uh, follow this post-stack migration route, okay? Where uh, you uh, you look at the data and you rule out any any traces or even them out. You do some filtering, okay? And uh, uh, in the class, you don't do uh, FK filtering uh, or dip filtering on the uh, on the records, and then you do some kind of balancing, okay? Um, and then there is uh, NMO correction, okay. And you, you, in my applied geophysics class, uh, you know, you would take, uh, um, uh, you would use NMO correction actually to uh, uh, get some idea of the velocities, okay. And then there is um, uh, binning and, and stacking. Basically, the you know, once you've determined the velocities, well, determining the velocities, you know, in my software is taken care of by the um, by the CV stacking operation and all the analysis that I have you do, and if you know if you want to do this uh, now, just so you can get more familiar with standard um, standard uh, uh, seismic processing, you know just look at my uh, applied geophysics course and and do the reflection lab. Um, you know it's uh, uh, and then if you're and you can do it early and I'll uh, I'll grade it early and then. You can just uh, sit back and uh, answer other people's questions when you when you actually take my class. <laughs> so if you're curious, uh, that that lab will guide you through the standard uh, sequence. And I, you know, I, I added a little bit uh, to the Dixie Valley um, uh, uh, processing, which is what this is explaining. Um, and then it's you know the NMO correction, uh, knowing the velocities, the CMP binning and stacking. That's all taken care of by um, a, uh, a method called uh, CMP stack, okay, common midpoint stacking. Um, and then what we're going to learn about in this class is Stolt migration. And here I, I show that it's it's time migration, okay. It doesn't, uh, as we'll find out, time migration doesn't take advantage of any velocities that you have um, where you characterize lateral variations in velocity. And of course, you know, in this situation, we've got a lot of lateral variation in velocity. You know, a factor of two, you know, from one point to another going across the fault. You know, even at the same level. So, uh, you know, the the post act migration only takes us so far, and uh, uh, so then to get the results that I, um, you know, trying to look below the uh, uh, the capping basalt and look at some of the deeper. Uh, 
stratigraphy in the basin out in the further parts of the survey, um, we had to do uh, uh, vol you know real velocity optimization. So we got velocities from first breaks, and uh, uh, and then we uh, we used uh, Satish's simulated annealing optimization to get a velocity section, which I, I won't show you here. Um, and then we took our, our records and used a slightly different uh, AGC um, for balancing before uh, before we did a uh, uh, a pre stack Kirchhoff migration. Okay, I will introduce Kirchhoff migration in the next couple weeks to you, um, and I'll hint at pre stack migration. But really, I cover pre stack migration much more in seven fifty seven. And then actually, there's uh, coherency enhancement. Uh, which I will try to cover right at the end of this class. I, it's, it's such a brilliant method that uh, I, I just can't resist showing it to you. So here's a, an interpretation that is uh, based on this uh, processing sequence. Um, and uh, this is the uh, post this is the post stack migration, okay, using uh, pretty much the uh, the methods that, that you're going to learn, uh, uh, you know, probably next week, we'll we'll get to cover it. Uh, you know, out here where coverage is poor, we see a lot of migration artifacts up against the right hand side. Coverage is pretty good out here on the left, and here you can see the 30 degree dipping fault plane in its true orientation. Uh, you can see the rollover aniforms uh, here in the capping basalt reflector. And then here in um, you know older parts of the basin, uh, you know early tertiary parts of the basin, probably in interbedded sediments and volcanics, um, you know, and, and below the Capi basalt, I can't quite see the uh, uh, the original. The I can't quite see the uh, uh, the reflection off the fault. Um, maybe some scraps of it here and there, but the uh, um, you know the, the essentially the onlap there is at a pretty high angle. You know, which is a good uh, a good indicator for uh, you know listric and, and low angle normal faulting. So here's an interpreted uh, uh, our interpretation for that, just showing the uh, the two separately. Um, you know, we got the uh, surface, and then 500 meters down is the uh, the capping basalt. Uh, we got the reflective. Um, uh, fault itself, and then I kind of trace it based on terminations. Below that, there's a few reflections that may contribute, and so we got a lot of rollover anticlines, which are, uh, um, yeah, they are real anticlines. Uh, you know, those are those are definitely uh, uh, signs of this uh, the listric uh, nature of the fault and the low angle nature here. So you know, really, we're taking. Uh, uh, I mean, this wouldn't be worth much without. Kasky's observations and mapping of the fault, uh, which shows that uh, it really is, uh, you know, at the surface at, at large scale, it's low angle. Not just you know near the surface, but uh, you know Kasky's work really, um, which I hope you guys got to see some of, um, you know, really uh, really shows that it's got to be a, an overall low angle fault. So here's here's kind of the uh, you know part of the um, interpretation. Uh, meld together with with all these different uh, techniques. Here's you know just from this little 100 meter section right at the top, you know there we, you could see that the the fault continues right up to the uh, uh, to the surface. Um, you could see the rollover anticlines you know hinted at here, um, and uh, you know here's an in, an independent gravity model, okay, which uh, also has a 30 degree dip. There's no way that you can put that. That step uh, from the uh, the Piedmont fault, uh, you can't ju you just can't put that that Piedmont fault and have a low density low velocity wedge in here. The gravity doesn't allow that either. Um, so uh, I think we have a pretty consistent story um, to say that uh, uh, we have a uh, not only not just a low angle normal fault in 1954. We have a low angle normal fault in um, um, uh, you know, ever since uh, 22, 23 million years. Okay, um, so uh, uh, it makes a very uh, a very nice story. All right.
Now, um, uh, at the geothermal field, you may have seen, uh, say, papers at uh, uh, GRC meeting or, or references papers at GRC meeting. There's no doubt, uh, and I've published on this too, there's no doubt that the same Dixie Valley Fault, okay, and here's this north, northeast view in, um, um, in Google Earth, the same Dixie Valley Fault is very steeply dipping up at the geothermal field. You know, seventy degrees maybe. Um, so you know, we go from thirty degrees here on this north. You know, here the the north striking uh, part of the fault uh, looks uh, askew, and then once we're following the northeast striking part of the fault, you know, it's got a much steeper dip. So up here at Dixie Meadows, where um, uh, Paul uh, uh, Carlin student uh, is working on uh, gravity. Uh, for the geothermal prospect there, um, you know it's all it's all steep normal faulting. Okay, nothing unusual there. Um, the only place we can prove there's a low angle fault is over here, you know, at between IXL Canyon and uh, um, and uh, uh, um, um, what is it called? Little and big uh, box canyon. Yeah, uh, so it's very clear there. Uh, and it's you know it's just a different segment of the fault with a different orientation, a different stress regime being expressed, um, and uh, you know although you know the 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 rupture in 1954 did continue along the northeast part, striking part of the fault, you know it didn't go all the way up. You can see off in the distance here that's the Pleasant Valley rupture. That's uh, the biggest earthquake in Nevada, probably of magnitude uh, uh, 7.5 in uh, in 1915. Okay, let me let me come a little closer to home. Um, this is a 3D survey shot over the Steamboat Hills. How about that? I bet you didn't know about that. We have uh, uh, 12 years ago, we had a 3D seismic uh, uh, shoot right here in Reno. Um, the Steamboat Hills is is now producing. You know, once once the operating company uh, realized that that our 3D survey showed that. Um, um, that they weren't be, going to be able to um, uh, to drill underneath their current reservoirs, uh, they were able to make a, a better plan to exploit the uh, the reservoirs that they had, and so um, I think uh, when this was shot, the production um, of both at the time the different companies owned uh, um, different companies owned different parts of the Steamboat Hills Reservoir. Um, and each one had about 20 uh, uh, megawatts of production. Uh, now the whole reservoir is up to uh, up to over 100 megawatts production. So um, uh, you know it took some time because uh, a lot of geologists had invested a lot of time uh, putting forward a uh, uh, a deep source hypothesis, which uh, and I'll show you why the uh, uh, the 3D seismic doesn't support that. Uh, and so it took him a lot of time to get used to uh, um, the uh, the result that we came out with. Okay, um, so the green uh, symbols here, uh, which uh, I'm sure in the video they won't be able to see them, uh, those are uh, receivers, and you can see they're kind of in lines draped over the topography here. It's pretty substantial topography, really, um, and the red are uh, are vibrator points. Okay, so even you know along some roads hanging on the side of the hill here that they've now excavated for the freeway, um, you know they, we were, they were able to get some vibrator points. So this is one of uh, Optum's early surveys that they were able to uh, uh, they were able to. I'm sorry, no red or uh, our gravity. So the uh, uh, I think I don't have the vibrator points on here. Okay. Uh, they're kind of uh, uh, in lines perpendicular. The vibrators uh, ran along lines perpendicular to the uh, to the receivers, and certainly along all the roads. So you know it's a very heterogeneous uh, survey. There's lots of you know there's no simple geometry here. You got to take the geometry as it is. You know even even a two dimensional um, approximation is not really going to do you any good. 
So using uh, pre-stack uh, migration, um, you know, we made a vol uh, an image volume. We also made a velocity volume. And um, uh, here it is. Uh, it's kind of a westward look view on the top and a, uh, a northward view uh, down here. And you can see that, that um, 3,000 feet below the, the summit of the, uh, of the hills, there's this uh, a moderately dipping uh, uh, reflector. Okay, and, and lots of artifacts, you know, especially around the fringes of the survey. Uh, and you can see that there's also a reflector that's uh, dipping uh, eastward. And, and in this view, it's got an apparent dip uh, that is pretty shallow. But that's only an apparent dip. Um, so it was really the, uh, again, as we find out time and again, um, the, these uh, depth slices in uh, in uh, 3D surveying, I mean, that's where we, they're golden. That is really where we find out all of our information now. Uh, if we have it, if we have 3D surveys, the depth slice tells all. And so what we've got is this kind of uh, arcuate, mostly east-west dipping, I'm sorry, east-west striking uh, fault A here, which comes out as a fairly bright reflector. I mean, we're talking about imaging through a volcanic pile here. so. We can't get the details of where every single flow ends. I mean, it's in there somewhere, but it's pretty confusing. Um, we can't get the thickness of individual flows. But when you have a through-going structure like this normal fault, we can see it as a reflector at, at lower frequencies. Right? These, these wavelengths here are uh, hundreds of feet, maybe 100 meters okay, in the image. So we see this east-west east striking, north-dipping fault. Okay. And um, and it's it's let's see this is um, this is about three thousand feet below the uh, uh, the wells okay that are that are producing and I think the blue squares are the wells I think uh, and it's intersected by this um, sort of northwest striking fault which is uh, northeast dipping uh, and maybe the intersection there is is really the conduit that's bringing fluids up. So what this showed them was, was, and it was not what they wanted to hear at all when, back when this was Caithness, before it was acquired by a couple more companies. I think it's an ORMAT operation now, um, Steamboat Hills, all of it. Uh, so so um, what it showed them was that there wasn't a deep pipe you know, coming up from, uh, you know, from the mantle and bringing those, those, those uh, hot fluids up. Uh, it was a... Uh, uh, it's coming from the north. You know, the here's uh, the Mount Rose Highway, and here's the uh, shopping center. Let's see, the Apple Store is down here. Here's the uh, Rayleigh Shopping Center. So the 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 fault then dips under uh, to the north, and so it's bringing those fluids up from uh, from a location that's not on the property. Okay, so they had to recognize that and you know realize they 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 really wanted to tap into this fault intersection. You know, which is a tilted line itself, and if you just drill into the, uh, you know, no matter how deep you drill into the uh, the foot wall of of this whole system, you're just going to get dry rock, and that's they did try it, and that's what they found. So um, uh, that was kind of a hard lesson, and it took them uh, took the operators here about ten years to uh, uh, to believe the seismic results, but now they've they've managed to more than double production. Uh, I really like this this cute little example. This is a very small scale example of of relative geometry. Um, we're looking at at um, this is the bottom of a uh, of an open pit mine, and there's a steep forty foot high uh, bench, okay, um, and it's basically vertical. And here you can see uh, that's probably Ken Mila standing there. Um, with a uh, two meter uh, stadia rod, I suppose, um, maybe three meter, and uh, um, you know, and we're looking at a uh, ten meter, uh, twelve meter, uh, uh, thirteen meter mine bench here, uh, and it's all diatomite, but it does have, a, uh, you know, there's fine structure, there's larger scale structure, uh, there's structure from fractures, which is you know what you're mostly seeing here. Uh, you can see some of the layering in the shadows. Okay, so uh, you know there's an analysis that you can get just by looking at the outcrop, and some of which is in this picture. 
Uh, and here's uh, kind of an oblique view. I don't know if you can uh, if you can uh, understand it. Um, uh, you know, it's kind of a lousy uh, kind of lousy drafting here. Um, up in this area here, um, we're on the the uh, level face of the bench, the level top of the bench, and then here's the bottom of the pit down here. And the picture was just looking to the left. And here's the face, okay, uh, which is uh, this exposed uh, diatomite. Of course, it's all diatomite at the top of the bench too. Uh, and that's only uh, ten meters there, okay. So this this gray line that's the edge, okay. Um, and uh, we managed to put geophones. Uh, Ken and his crew managed to put geophones right up to the edge without falling off, which is good. Um, I don't know that we'd be allowed to do that now. Too many worries about uh, uh, about uh, liability, I suppose. Um, and you can see we did this network of lines, you know, approaching the the face. The idea was to try and get an image of the uh, of the face itself as a seismic reflector. Okay, you know, it's a it's a free surface boundary, and the free surface should have a a reflection coefficient of one. Okay, so it should be a strong reflector. The the hard part is is getting the uh, the energy you know uh, to come to the face and then bounce back to where we can see it. All right, we can see some of it. Um, oh boy, I really got to normalize the sizes of all these. Uh, here's a seismic record kind of presented in a in a in a weird way. Instead of instead of offset. Um, well, I don't know. Let, let me, um, um, you know, if I if I uh, if I rotated this so that uh, the offset axis was horizontal and the time was, axis was vertical, then it would look like a normal seismic record, right? You got the first arrival, you got some reflections down here, um, and and then notice there's this reflection that's coming up. It's getting to be less time. At uh, uh, at greater distance, right? At greater offset, right? Here's very small offset at the top from the from the source, and here's you know 18 meters offset from the source, and that's actually right at the face. So this this is actually reflecting back, and that's the first evidence that it's reflecting back from the free surface at the face. You know, this is taken on the top of the the mine bench. So uh, you know we we can't we can't do anything. Uh, I mean, normal move out, right? That always normal move out always assumes that as offset increases, time is going to increase, right? What do you do with a reflection like this that has uh, time decreasing as offset increases? You can't you can't apply stacking. You got to go straight to an image from. Um, um, uh, you got to go straight to an image from from a uh, uh, from the raw record, okay? And I, you know, I was not uh, terribly impressed by uh, by this face image, but um, you know, we were able to see uh, uh, you know some of the features that you can see in the photo. Some of the layering is in there. Some of the fracturing is in there. I think this uh, you know this discontinuity here. That's actually the the bottom of the. Uh, um, that's the bottom of the pit, right? You can see that as a reflector, interestingly enough, and the the reflections are, are have, have a discontinuity right here at the face. Okay, so uh, and this is a cross section, um, you know, with the uh, face on the right hand side, and all the uh, you know sources and receivers uh, in here. So. Um, uh, you know that was uh, maybe not as satisfactory as we'd like. You know maybe if I try this at a larger scale, and I do have some data from uh, Upheaval Dome where we're looking at cliff faces uh, that are uh, you know like two or three thousand feet high, um, and we have a larger scale seismic experiment that approaches the cliff face. So I need to. Uh, uh, I'd still like to look at those and see if I can find uh, the face geometry. Oh, that was um, 
Oh gosh, it was a 3D um, data viewer that was popular, um, you know, ten years ago. Uh, and I can't remember the name of it. Uh, I don't think it's available oh, anymore. Nice yeah, yeah, it was a good one. Um, I'll show you some other 3D views that are, um, you know, even more interesting, but um, but also using software that you can't get anymore. Yeah, I mean now our only choice is is you know if we can't plot it in MATLAB, right? Mm -hmm. Then our choice is to um, is to use some some kind of um, um, yeah here we go. Our choice is to use some kind of um, 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 seismic uh, interpretation program like Open Detect or or uh, um, Kingdom, you know. And those are those are pretty good at 3D viewing, and they they will do the 3D volumetric, you know, volume, uh, and the volume, um, um, what do you call it? The 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 uh, voxel rendering, you know, partially transparent vo voxels instead of pixels, and that is uh, uh, that is exactly what we need for looking at velocity, like tomography results in 3D. Uh, and then for these seismic reflectivity results, it can be uh, very useful as well. Um, you know, Annie Annie was able to use it in her uh, thesis on on Hawthorne um, it, to uh, uh, you know actual, actual voxel rendering, it, and that was done in Open Detect. So it was uh, you know it wasn't as high a quality as as some of the stuff I'd done twenty years ago even. Um, but that was with some extremely expensive hardware and software. Okay, so uh, yeah, you know, it's it's good for us to think about three D and and you know this this ancient diagram uh, of a seismic reflection survey um, tells it still it still applies. Okay, uh, instead of the uh, the shot hole now. Um, you know, located somewhere in this 2D array of of, uh, of geophones, instead of a shot hole, we'll we'll put a vibrator truck there. And nowadays, instead of having vibrator trucks marching in a line, you know, up and down the 2D lines, or or maybe going crosswise, um, what companies are doing now is uh, they'll set out 20,000 channels, you know, 20,000 these little axes, 20,000 geophones or more, and they'll um, They'll scatter the vibrators all over the landscape, and the vibrators will be going off uh, even simultaneously, and the uh, the processing software works out how to prevent the signals from it from interfering. It's really amazing, um, and uh, uh, what you get out of this, you know, is apparent here too. Um, you know, not only do we have um, you know some fairly wide angles of reflections. You know you get a reflection bounces bounces down to here and then uh, comes up to a receiver way over here. You're getting a fairly wide angle reflection, right? I mean if the if the if the waves you know comes from the shot hole, bounces off the structure, and comes right back to uh, one of these receivers right next door, um, you know we call that zero offset. Okay, that's that's like the, the chirp experiment. Okay, but what we're doing is is much broader. Okay, we're getting wider angle, and notice that that with with the two D array like this for three D data, we're also getting um, uh, we're also getting what I would call wide azimuth data. Okay, there's one azimuth, you know, from the shot bouncing off the structure to this corner, a very dis, dis, different azimuth bouncing off the structure to this corner here, very different azimuth bouncing off the structure to over there. Okay, and that's really critical. That's uh, the the wide azimuth data is critical for uh, the uh, uh, really critical for the um, uh, the analysis and the and getting that that reflector geometry correct in three dimensions. Okay, so you know if we if we and this is the way it used to be done, uh, and the way it still is done in the marine environment. You know, if we uh, one day we collect this line, shots and receivers all along this line, the next day we come back, we collect this line, shots and receivers all on the second line, so forth, you know, serially doing 2D lines. 
and then putting together like a stack of cards. That is 3D data, and that, that, that's better than having only one line, but it's narrow azimuth, NAZ, NAS data. And, and what we really need for 3D structures is WAS data, wide azimuth. 